All right, we're going to look today at the abolition movement. Uh, this is the largest and most successful reform movement of the first half of the 19th century, um, the movement to abolish slavery, again, abolition. Uh, and we're going to begin by taking a look at slavery itself uh, in the early 1800s, in the first half of the 1800s. Now, the census of 1860, which was the last census taken while slavery was legal, shows that there were about 4 million enslaved persons in the United States. And that's out of a total population of around 31 and a half million. Um, the census shows that about one quarter of uh, the white families in the South owned slaves. Um, less than 1% of the slaveholders held more than 100 slaves. Um, the typical slaveholder is a small independent farmer who owned maybe one to nine slaves. We find that about 75% of slaveholders uh, fell into this category. Now this map um, on the slide shows uh, slave population by county in the southern United States in 1861. So it was based on the, that census of 1860. Um, and, and you can see that uh, the areas shaded darkest um, are, are counties that, uh, that have 80% or more enslaved population. Uh, so you can see, I'm to make this work, um, you can see this area here in the Mississippi Delta uh, as being a large slaveholding population. Um, the Cotton Belt in through here um, is a great number of enslaved persons. Uh, East Texas around the Houston area as well is a heavy area for growing cotton. Uh, we can just note that Tarrant County here, um, its enslaved population in 1861 was about 14 percent of the population. Um, in Virginia, this is where slaves are still uh, growing great amounts of tobacco. Um, but, but cotton more and more is the predominant crop uh, in the South. Now, the majority of slaves worked in the fields. Um, they worked from sunup to sundown. And, and usually by this point in time, by the early, by the, by the middle of the 1800s, the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, um, it's cotton that is the primary um, crop um, worked by slaves. About two-thirds of the slaves work in the cotton fields. Uh, the remaining third um, are employed, are forced to grow cotton, uh, sorry, to grow tobacco, sugar, rice, and hemp, and food, of course, um, for, for, um, for themselves and for, and for the whites. Now, slaves worked all year long all year long except for the week between Christmas and New Year's. That was traditionally a slave holiday. Um, and, and it was a it was it was seen as a way to, to possibly um, tamp down possible rebellions if, if slaves know that they have a, a break coming um, between Christmas and New Year's that perhaps they'd be less likely to rebel. Now According to slave codes, and you remember that those are laws that regulated the behavior of slaves, slaves could not own property, they could not make contracts, they could not legally marry. Um, slave marriages were not recognized by the states as legal marriages, um, even though they may have uh, 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 had a ceremony to, uh, uh, to, to marry. Um, another slave. Um, but again, those were not legally sanctioned and recognized by the states. Um, slaves could not testify in court against a white person. Slaves could not leave the plantation or farm without their owner's written permission. Uh, it was a crime for a slave to strike a white person even in self-defense. Slaves could not gather in large groups except perhaps at, at church services. And in most southern states, it was illegal to teach a slave to read or write. Now, 
for the folder assignment, uh, you're going to be reading a chapter from um, from, from a book um, from Frederick Douglass by Frederick Douglass, um, the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave. Uh, you're going to be reading the first chapter of his uh, of his biography here, his autobiography. Uh, Douglas, yeah, as you'll see in the first chapter, is is talking about his childhood, but throughout the book, he uh, he, he talks about other um, issues and uh, uh, and conditions of, of slaves, and so I'm going to be referring to um, to, to Douglas's book on occasion. Um, Frederick Douglass, in his book, wrote about the reasons for not allowing slaves to learn to read or write. Uh, Douglass himself was taught his ABCs when he was uh, a young boy by one of the, um, of the slave mistresses um, until her husband forced her to stop, um, arguing that uh, education would ruin slaves, that it would make them and I quote, discontented and unhappy. And let's think about it, knowledge is power. If slaves could read, if slaves could read, they would learn about the world. They would learn about freedom. They would want that freedom. Um, the, 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 uh, the laws that mandated that slaves be kept um, from the knowledge that could be gained from reading was quite deliberate. Uh, if they if they don't know of worlds out um, other than the one they live in, uh, perhaps it was assumed they they would be more content and um, and not rebel and not want slaves and not want freedom. But but again, Frederick Douglass taught himself to read and write. Uh, once he had the, those those basic building blocks of the ABCs, um, he he made it his mission as a child to learn to read, to learn to write. Um, he figured that education must be something that was important if it was something that the master did not want him to have. What we find in the South is that whipping was the most common form of punishment for slaves. And sometimes owners went too far and they killed their slaves. Now, Frederick Douglass wrote about that in his, in his book as well. Uh, he told of his wife's cousin um, who was murdered in the course of punishment. And let me read to you what he says. Quote, the wife of Mrs. Giles Hick, living but a short distance from where I used to live, murdered my wife's cousin a young girl between 15 and 16 years of age, mangling her person in the most horrible manner, breaking her nose and breastbone with a stick so that the poor girl expired in a few hours afterwards. The offense for which this girl was murdered was this. She had been set that night to mind Mrs. Hicks' baby, and during the night she fell asleep, and the baby cried. She did not hear the crying. Uh, the girl and the baby were both in the room with Mrs. Hicks. Mrs. Hicks, finding the girl slow to move, jumped from her bed, seized an oak stick of wood by the fireplace, and with it broke the girl's nose and breastbone, and thus ended her life. There were no consequences for this murder. And you may remember the slave code that we looked at from Virginia back in the 1700s. Uh, very clearly stated that, that if, a, if a slave died as a result of punishment, it, it was not considered a felony. Douglas's book tells of other instances of slaves who were killed in the course of punishment. I urge you, if you have the chance, to read the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass. If you Google it, you can find many free editions, e-books, um, e-editions, electronic editions of this book that you can access. It is a highly readable and fascinating account of slavery. Now, even before the Civil War begins in 1861, we should note that there were two conflicting images of slavery in America. This first image was one of um, 
a romantic um, a romantic image of a South that was characterized by happy singing slaves, uh, banjo music, Southern bells in hoop skirts, um, and kindly white folks who looked after their slaves. And, and this is the type of romantic, totally unrealistic image that is presented in movies uh, such as such as Gone with the Wind, which is what these pictures are from, uh, a 1939 Hollywood film, um, a blockbuster film um, that presented this this rosy image of uh, of Southerners, um, the Civil War and slavery. Now, what we find is that even after the Civil War, however, even historians perpetuated this romantic vision of the South. Southern historians wrote of the benevolent institution of slavery. Slavery wasn't so bad, they wrote. And Northern historians, not wishing to offend their Southern colleagues, uh, did little to contradict those versions of Southern history. It is only really in the middle of the 20th century uh, and, and the civil rights movement in America um, that historians truly begin to challenge that romantic view of slavery in the Civil War, to try to, to try to present the truth of slavery, to try to tell the realities of the, uh, of the horrors of the institution of slavery. Now, even Frederick Douglass in his book from again back in the 1800s um, Douglas even Douglas Frederick Douglas talks about this myth of the happy slave um, that the South was trying to promote um, he, he says that he said that people often asked him well if, if slaves are unhappy why do we hear them singing in the fields Douglas said in his book and I quote slaves sing most when they're most unhappy. The songs of the slave represent the sorrows of his heart, and he's relieved by them as an aching heart is relieved by tears. Those songs, he said, breathe the prayer and complaint of souls boiling over with the bitterest anguish. Every tone was a testimony against slavery and a prayer to God for deliverance from chains. Now the other image of slavery was the image depicted by the abolitionists who were working to end the institution of slavery. According to abolitionists, slaves were brutalized by constant fear of whipping, by bloodhounds who were trained to chase runaways. The abolitionists told of children taken from their mothers to be sold away. The image depicted by the abolitionists told of disease, and starvation, and death because of the callous Southern masters who terrorized the lives of slaves. And you see here some of the, some of the images that, uh, that were presented um, to depict the horrors of slavery. The, uh, the picture of the man with scars on his back um, he was a slave who, who escaped to the north. Um, those, those scars on his back were, were the results of beatings after beatings after beatings that left those permanent, that permanent disfigurement uh, of his back. Now in truth, you know, some slaves were probably treated well and others endured the harshest of conditions. As with any human endeavor, it depended on the slaveholder, I guess, as to how the slaves were treated. Some slaveholders prided themselves on being good masters, um, refusing to whip their slaves. Others, I'm going to assume, others were sadistic, evil people who probably took pleasure in torturing their slaves. 
But, but to me, the ultimate tragedy and sl shame of slavery lies in the mere fact that it existed. That one person could own another. That human beings were treated as property. That one segment of the population of the United States was denied the basic rights the basic rights of freedom and kept in bondage in what was supposed to be a free and just nation. Slavery was the ultimate in hypocrisy. It made a mockery of the ideals of the Declaration of Independence, the Revolution, the Constitution. And one of the biggest questions I have always had about this nation is this, why did it take this country so long to end slavery? Why did it take almost 100 years of this nation's existence to abolish slavery? The fact is that up until the 1830s, Slavery was not really a divisive issue in the United States. Most Americans accepted it as the status quo. Now, it had been abolished in all of the northern states by 1830. But I don't really think too many people were really all that concerned about abolishing it in the South. Now, many powerful and wealthy Southerners were racked with guilt over the practice of slavery. Thomas Jefferson, the former president, who had owned slaves his whole life. Thomas Jefferson, however, agonized over Southern slavery. He once wrote about it, saying this, quote, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just. The Almighty has no attribute which can take side with us in such a contest. Jefferson may have agonized and felt guilty, but he had slaves. He owned slaves until the day he died. Now many, many may have been troubled by slavery, but most whites worried that freeing the slaves would cause major social problems. Where would they go? What would they do? They saw nothing but chaos resulting if millions of Southern slaves were suddenly free. They believed that blacks weren't ready to be free, that only time would prepare the slaves for freedom Now, this is not to say that there had not been solutions that had been proposed. Um, and in 1817, an organization was founded called the American Colonization Society. Uh, the American Colonization Society believed that, um, that freed slaves should be transported to West Africa that um, that if 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 newly freed southern slaves were removed from the United States then then perhaps southerners would be encouraged to free them to free their slaves um, to free them and move them out of the United States now the American Colonization Society did in fact help to establish the Republic of Liberia in uh, in West Africa, and, and approximately 11,000 uh, American blacks did indeed settle there and help to establish that nation. But colonization wasn't the answer, because honestly, few American blacks were willing to go to Africa. Huh? The slaves in America had been born in America. They were they were generations removed from Africa. Their homes were 
in America. They wanted to stay in the country that they'd been born in, that their parents had been born in, that they had helped to build. Again, this was not going to be a permanent solution. This was not going to be the way to end slavery. So what we really find is that most Americans before 1830 who did want to end slavery favored a gradual abolition of slavery. Do it slowly. Right. Over time. Um, not now. Later, the slaves could be freed. If you slave, if you free the slaves too fast, right, only chaos would result. What, what are you going to do with four million freed slaves? But, but after 1830, what we're going to see is that the goals of abolitionists begin to change. Uh, they're going to move from a, an acceptance of the idea of the gradual abolition of slavery, gradualism, to begin to embrace the idea of the immediate end of slavery. Immediatism. And at the same time, we're going to see events occurring that will cause Southerners to start to try to dig in to protect slavery in the South. So how do abolitionists move from the idea of gradualism to the idea of immediatism? William Lloyd Garrison is an abolitionist who is key to this, to this change. Um, in 1831, Garrison was a 24-year-old Massachusetts newspaper man who was adamant in his insistence that slavery must stop now. He deplored the idea of gradualism. He promoted immediatism. He called for the immediate end of slavery. Slavery was evil, he said, pure and simple. And in January of 1831, he began the publication of a new anti-slavery newspaper called The Liberator. In the first issue of this newspaper, he denounced the moderate approach to abolition favored by the gradualists. He wrote that he was declaring war on slavery, that the days of compromise and discussion on this issue are over, that slavery must end. In the first editorial that he published in this newspaper, he wrote, and I quote, I am in earnest. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will not retreat a single inch, and I will be heard. Now, now Garrison was unpopular, both in the North and the South, actually, for, for, this, for this stance calling for the immediate abolition of slavery. Because many believed that this extreme rhetoric calling for the immediate end of slavery might cause slaves to rebel. And although there is no evidence to suggest that the liberator ever found its way into the hands of Southern slaves who could read, there was indeed a slave rebellion just eight months after Garrison began publishing The Liberator. On the night of August 21st, 1831, a very religious slave by the name of Nat Turner began a rebellion with a group of trusted friends. Turner had interpreted a solar eclipse he'd seen earlier to be a sign from God that it was time for the slaves to rebel. He will eventually gather about 70 slaves and free blacks in support of this rebellion. And they traveled from house to house in the county in Virginia in which they lived. 
freeing slaves and killing the whites that they encountered using knives, hatchets, and axes. Now, the rebellion was put down after about three or four days, but Turner escaped. Um, and, and for about six weeks, he was, um, he was um, on the loose until he was captured. Turner and 56 others were executed for this rebellion. We need to understand that after Nat Turner's rebellion, Southerners began to panic. In many places throughout the South, including Virginia, where this rebellion had occurred, slaves outnumbered whites. And Turner had been able to read. They know that. He's a minister in the slave church. He can read. And so many Southerners believed that it had been writings like Garrison's, those radical abolitionists who were calling for the immediate end of slavery, that, that those writings had caused Turner to believe he could successfully rebel. Now, most likely, Nat Turner had never heard of William Lloyd Garrison. But Southerners will place the blame for Nat Turner's rebellion at the feet of the abolitionists like Garrison, who were calling for the immediate end of slavery. Southern anti-slavery organizations disappeared. Southerners began to face up, in a sense, to the fact that slavery was vital to their economy, that they simply would not make as much money if they did not have free slave labor. Southerners began to move to protect the institution of slavery. Southern states banned the distribution of abolitionist literature within the southern states, making it a crime uh, to sell publications like the Liberator, or even or even just to, to pass them around to, to other readers. Southern politicians and academics began to put out their own propaganda, arguing that slavery was a positive good to society, that, that the Bible sanctioned slavery, that the great civilizations of Greece and Rome had been slaveholding societies, one Virginia sociologist wrote that Southern slaves were taken care of and protected. Why, they were better off than those wage earners in the factories up north. He wrote, and I quote, a merrier being does not exist on the face of the globe than the Negro slave of the United States. Laws began to be passed in southern states that made it hard to free slaves. County governments began to institute slave patrols at night to watch, to watch for possible rebellions of slaves. In other words, the South was digging in. After 1831, it was pretty clear that the South was not going to give up slavery without a fight. But it was just as clear that the Northern abolitionists were gearing up to give them that fight. William Lloyd Garrison was just one of many important abolitionists um, in the United States. And I want to briefly take a look at a few others. David Walker. And we have no pictures of him. David Walker was a free black businessman in Boston who published a pamphlet in uh, 1829 called The Appeal. The Appeal to the Colored Citizens of the World. In The Appeal, Walker states that unless whites abolished the institution of slavery, Blacks throughout the world had a moral obligation to rise up in violent rebellion against them. David Walker died the following year in 1830, um, apparently of tuberculosis. But, but, but his, his pamphlet was widely distributed. 
um, hand to hand, really, by people who wanted to get his message out. He made a difference. Theodore Dwight Weld was a white minister from Ohio who established training schools for abolitionist lecturers, teaching people how to organize, how to, how to make ex effective speeches um, to, uh, to spread the word of abolition. And the people that he trained in his schools would travel throughout the North, setting up abolitionist societies in their own towns. Sarah and Angelina Grimke, and um, I believe that uh, they were mentioned or the, uh, in some of the information about the women's movement earlier. Um, Sarah and Angelina Grimke were two sisters, Southerners. Uh, they were the daughters of slaveholders. Um, they broke from their families, um, went north to work for the abolition of slavery. Um, the Grimke sisters um, were trained by Weld um, and went on to establish many women's abolitionist societies in the North. Um, but on a more personal note here, we should note that uh, Sarah and, or sorry, sorry, Angelina Grimke and Theodore Dwight Weld eventually married. Um, they had three children and uh, they continued their abolition work and work for women's rights throughout their lives. Sojourner Truth. Sojourner Truth had been born a slave in New York in 1797. Her name was Isabella. She was freed in 1827 when New York abolished slavery. Sojourner Truth was a very powerful speaker who eventually um, began to speak to uh, in, in abolitionist uh, at abolitionist gatherings to tell her story. She had, as a slave, been sold five times. One of her owners beat her so badly that her arms and shoulders were scarred for the rest of her life. And if she was speaking to an all-female audience, she would sometimes show those scars, show, so, show those shoulders so that they could see the physical results of slavery. She had borne five children by a fellow slave and seen all of them sold away from her. In the 1830s, after she was freed, she worked as a seamstress, but in 1843, she had a vision. She said that God had spoken to her and told her that her mission was to wander the country, be a sojourner, a traveler, and speak the truth, the truth about slavery. You can imagine, I think, the impact that Sojourner Truth could have by telling her story to a white audience, by telling the truth about what she had lived through. Harriet Tubman was another important woman in the abolition movement. Uh, Harriet Tubman was instrumental in establishing uh, the Underground Railroad, uh, a series of safe houses from the south to the north uh, in which slaves could uh, could stop for a for a meal, a night's sleep, uh, as they as they traveled um, to freedom uh, in the north. Harriet Tubman herself escorted many slaves to freedom, and in fact, she was known as Moses. She led her people to freedom. John Brown. John Brown was a white northerner who, as we'll see later, used violence in his crusade against slavery. John Brown believed that he'd been chosen by God to end slavery. We're going to take a look at him a little bit later when we uh, look at the road to the Civil War. <laughs> 
uh, there's a couple of, of um, turning points that he was, he was involved with that uh, will help lead the country into the Civil War. But we should know that he will pay for his beliefs with his life when he was hanged in 1859, and we'll note him a little later on. But finally, probably the most important abolitionist was Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass, again, who had been born into slavery, who had, who had escaped slavery, went on to become a powerful speaker, an organizer, and writer for the abolition movement. Douglas wrote many books. He published an abolitionist newspaper. He is considered to be the most influential African-American of the 19th century. Besides working tirelessly to end slavery and then after the Civil War, working for equal rights for African-Americans, Douglas was also involved in the women's rights movement, the temperance movement, um, promoting the idea of free public education for all students. He worked for the end of the death penalty. He believed strongly in the equality of every single human being. And he believed in the values that were embodied in the U.S. Constitution. He believed that, that if the Constitution, if the, the Declaration were, uh, if, if values, um, if, if those values were, were, were made real, what a country, what a country this could be, he said. Less than one month before Frederick Douglass died in 1895, a young black man interviewing him asked if he had any advice for African Americans just starting out in the world. Frederick Douglass said he did. His advice was this. Agitate, agitate, agitate. In other words, make waves. Let your voice be heard. Speak up to change things, to, to fight wrongs, to work for a better world. Agitate, agitate. Agitate.